Boston celebrated a landmark moment today, the swearing in of its first African-American police commissioner, Willie Gross. But as is so often the case when Boston and race are uttered in the same sentence, an underbelly of tension is roiling another department. For those who thought segregation was a problem of the past, it's a rude awakening. But for many who have kids in the Boston public school system, it's a pattern they've been watching worsen for years. A Boston Globe report out over the weekend found that nearly 60% of the city's schools are now what they call intensely segregated. That means comprised of at least 90% students of color. Two decades ago, just 42% of schools crossed that unfortunate threshold, and many of these schools are low-performing. It's a problem. The busing that began in the 70s was supposed to help solve. But over the years, we've been slowly moving back toward a system that gives preferences to students within a school's neighborhood. A Northeastern University study out last month found the new computerized home-based assignment system that places students in Boston schools has been locking many black and Latino students out of high-performing options because there aren't enough close to where they live. But school officials argue it's not so cut and dry. We invited them to send someone to join us for this discussion, but they declined. They did, however, send us a series of what they called counterpoints, making the case that, according to their numbers, it's the overall increase of Latino students that's leading to the perception of increased segregation. They say 20 years ago there were six schools in which black students were highly segregated, but now there's just one such school. There has been an increase in schools where Latinos are highly segregated, up from three 20 years ago to nine now. And they say no school is intensely segregated with either black or Latino populations alone. I'm not sure that distinction is relevant to begin with, but maybe my guests feel differently. Joined now by Tanisha Sullivan. She's president of the Boston branch of the NAACP. Tanisha, good to see you again. Good to see you. Jessica Tang, head of the Boston Teachers Union. Jessica, thanks for coming. And Paul Revels, former secretary of education in Massachusetts. He's now a professor at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. Paul, it's good to see you, too. Good to be here, Jim. According to the Globe, just a couple of uh, comments on this uh, report. The president of the city council said it was devastating, was her word. The head of the Civil Rights Project, at UCLA, which used to be at Harvard, That's I'm sure right. you know, said Boston is the least interested in talking about race and social issues, meaning of major cities. People want to be satisfied with the status quo. Starting with you, you agree with those mm -hmm. comments? I think this report is deeply troubling. It should so? be troubling for all of us um, who care about not only quality public public education for all of our children, but also diversity, right? Um, the fact that we have report after report showing us, telling us that black and Latino students are not accessing the high quality educational opportunities that exist in Boston public schools at the rates that black and, and that white and Asian mm -hmm. students are should be troubling for all of us. You uh, share that perspective, you're nodding. Well, absolutely. I, this does not come as a surprise, as concerning as it is to those of us who've been on the front lines. And for many years now, we've actually been saying, you know, we absolutely understand why families want to be close to home. But if we don't have fully invested quality schools in every single neighborhood, then that's going to actually increase inequity. And speaking of other neighborhoods, I think the, the number they came up with is roughly five schools with majority white. They talked about additional resources from parents, higher performing, sort of a segregation of a different kind. Were you troubled by what you uh, read? Yeah, I do find it troubling, Jim, but at the same time, I haven't seen the study in its original form, and uh, we've got fairly superficial coverage from the globe, and I'd love to see more evidence. I mean, for example, the statistics you showed at the top of the program, where uh, intensely segregated is defined at 90 percent, and it's everybody but white people included in that number, and then it says 20 years ago it was only 42 percent. Well, the demographics of the system have changed completely. So now only 14 percent of the school district is white. So if you go plus or minus five percentage points off, uh, you know, the 86, you're up over 90. Uh, and the fact that you get there in somewhat over half schools isn't surprising. So, I mean, you've got to look. I, By the way, I, that, that thing you just saw was the overall racial uh, breakdown of the uh, students in the public schools. But no, but, but in, the, of, uh, in the school, intensely segregated is defined as 90%. Correct. And 86% of, of the system color, overall so is, 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 so I think we have to, we've really got to think the basic terminology we're using here. What defines a quality school? What define? I mean, the biggest form of segregation we have is housing and the fact that we organize our public schools around geographic uh, boundaries uh, that keeps Boston but in Boston. But are you Boston. quarreling with the underlying premise here that? I, I'm, yeah, the trends that, that are, are, are being talked about um, 
are not as clear cut as the headlines suggest. And well, one last thing about one, by the way, they mentioned that it's a, a majority minority district. Your point about 86 percent. But it, what is the relevance of what the school department sent us that you have to add up blacks and yeah. Latinos? So, yeah, add up blacks and Latinos. They're people of color. And but, but to me, the big challenge here is not let's develop a better game of musical chairs to move students around to the quality schools that we identify around the city. The real challenge is how do we make quality schools everywhere? So in every neighborhood, you've got a quality school. That should be the number one challenge. What I, I, I agree with that. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that what we have today is a policy that by virtue of what the data is, is telling us today is, is serving to increase segregation in our schools. What's the cause that of this, should, Tanisha? That should never be the case. What's the cause? Um, I think that they, I think there are a number of factors at play. I mean, one is certainly, as Dr. Rowe pointed out, we do live in a city that is that is significantly segregated along racial and ethnic lines, and so the very notion that we would say that we're just going to push um, push our students into neighborhood schools will inevitably, without any intentionality around diversity, will inevitably create more segregated schools. So I would argue that this particular way of assigning our students is actually doing more to harm our efforts relative to diversity than, than it is doing to help us. Can I stay on cause for a second? Gary Orfield is a guy from UCLA I mentioned a minute ago. Do you agree that Boston is the least interested in talking about race and social issues? I mean, basically, I'll, I'll put words in his mouth. We don't care about issues of race, he's suggesting. Do you agree with that? Well, I think that when you're in a school that's been systematically under-resourced and under-invested in, and we've had opportunities at the state legislature, for example, in this past session, to actually change the funding formula. It hasn't been changed in 25 years, or implement recommendations that were given three years ago, and haven't, for example, increased the revenue in our schools that don't have a full-time nurse, don't have a social worker, guidance counselor, and staffing that we know students need, then you start to wonder, well, then who does care? She thinks about money. You don't think it's about money, do you? Well, I mean, I, I, I sympathize with the, I'm very disappointed the legislature didn't pass the uh, changes to the funding formula, so let me stipulate that. I don't think the immediate problem in Boston is one of money per se in terms of how we distribute the money that we have in Boston between schools. But I do think where you have some schools that have access to, uh, through the charitable giving of parents or other people surrounding the school, to be able to have more programs and services available for students, that's a problem. Because typically that happens in the schools with the most advantaged students. And what we really need is a system that gives uh, the services and supports and opportunities to those who don't come by them at home. But the question so is, Marjorie Egan was here, and we spend time on the radio with you every couple yeah. of weeks. <laughs> she yeah. would say, we've been hearing that for four 40 years, what do we do in the immediate future to try to provide a, a higher quality education for kids of color while we're reaching for that point that you mentioned where every school is a high performing school? One of the points going back to Brown v. Board and certainly back to the desegregation efforts in Boston was if we, may, if we didn't have racially isolated students, if we distributed white students around all the schools, then no schools would be discriminated against in the way the budget was handed out because people wouldn't want to discriminate against schools in which whites were located. And that was part of the original theory. And we now have a strengthened set of laws and regulations that prevent against the maldistribution. In other words, we can, we can observe, we can get the data on how money is being distributed, but it's being distributed in a pattern that is, you know, where equal isn't equitable. So in some places, we need much more. Students need more in terms of To create of a level playing field to begin Preschool, with. Preschool, after what, school, What do you think part of the solution? Healthcare. Well, I do want to go back to your, your original question relative to race. I do think part of the problem with this particular policy is that it was race neutral on its face. And, when we, and it did not take into, into consideration the vast, whether we're talking about economic inequality that exists in this city, um, or it talks about the vast, um, the, the vast, again, segregation that already exists in the city, ignoring race in this policy, I think, was a misstep. Um, and I do think that as a city, we have to be willing to be intentional about factoring in race whenever we're looking at implementing policies of this nature. You know, when I met you a couple of years ago, I mentioned one of your predecessors, who was a good friend of mine, Kathy Kelly, former president of the Boston Teachers Union, who once said at a legislative hearing, if to uh, uh, people in B, if you're just going to give me money for what's in the classroom, don't bother. Mm -hmm. If my kid leaves my mm -hmm. student, she was a kindergarten teacher yeah. or first grade teacher, yeah. if my kid leaves a, an unsafe home, walks through an unsafe neighborhood, and is hungry when she gets to school, yeah. 
it's almost like LeBron James, mm. yeah. uh, you know, That's 30 cool. years. I mean, that is, this wraparound thing is part of what's got to happen, right? Absolutely, and that's why we've been advocating so hard for that. We're not saying throw money at a problem and just hope it fixes things. We are saying we need the funding specifically to lower class sizes to make sure that our special education students, our EL students, have the resources and supports they need. And there, we have to talk about race, too, because if you look at which schools are highly chosen, which schools have the longest wait list, they also have more resources. And oftentimes it's because the families are bringing those extra fundraising efforts in. And then you have schools that don't have the extra investments. And we, I think we agree that they need extra investments mm -hmm. for equity, not just equal right. investments. Right. Yeah. And that's not happening. And it does break down along racial lines, and we've got to address that. We only have 15 seconds left, but what I said before about Kathy Kelly is true. I mean, at some point, the big picture has well, got to be looked at. You have to look at, at the life solve... of the whole child. Exactly. It's, it's not just the school and the school intervention that's going to bring us to an equitable society. It's preparing children for success. Those of us who have privilege know how to do it with our own children. We need to build public systems that do it for all children. we got to go. Obviously, mm -hmm. we have a lot more to do. Mm -hmm. We'll do it another night. I promise. Tanisha, it's good to see good you. To see Jessica, you. thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Paul, as always. Okay, Jim. Thank you. Three.